Today is May 9th, 2020. My name is Daniel Burke. I am a longtime member of the International LaRouche Movement, founded by Lyndon LaRouche. And I am also an independent candidate for US Senate in New Jersey. Uh, so today I have the honor of being a moderator on this second International Youth Summit of the Schiller Institute, which was founded uh, by Helga Zepp LaRouche, who is joining us today. She is the founder and president of the Schiller Institute, which is an international organization. Um, today, we are uh, convening as part of an urgent mobilization to build a youth movement capable of propelling the governments of the world into the appropriate actions needed to rescue humanity from the crisis. And uh, um, without further ado, Helga Zeplarouche, the founder and president of the Schiller Institute. Please go ahead. Yes, hello. Um, I greet all of you. And let me first tell you that I'm really extremely happy to speak to you in so many different countries. One could take the view that it's a difficult situation for young people to be confronted with the world as it is today. Um, and you know that for sure has some merit, that view. But I would like to borrow a point of view from Charles de Gaulle when he came to Germany in September 1962 uh, this was, you know, in the post-war period, the relationship between France and Germany was still not very uh, friendly because of the Second World War and previous wars. So Charles de Gaulle came to Ludwigsburg and he addressed 10,000 young people who had gathered there. And he said, he started his remarks with the uh, following <clears throat> idea. He said, let me first congratulate you that you are young. And I think that that is something I wish to say to you too, because you know, it is the human ingenuity that when faced with incredible challenges, that we can go beyond our initial identity and really take on issues which are larger <clears throat> than ourselves. And it is the energy of the youth and the ability to learn from the mistakes of previous generations, which can give you the authority to change history. And the task in front of us and in front of you is not a smaller one than to remedy something which has been wrong in this present financial system, which should have been corrected a long time ago, but now it forces itself as an absolute necessity if humankind is supposed to continue to exist in any decent shape or form. And that is to abandon a system which for many centuries, and especially in the last decades, has created a situation where the poor become more poor and more numerous and a few people become more rich and become multi-billionaires and think that they can take all the privileges of this present system for themselves at the disregard of the rest of the human species. Now this fundamental injustice in the present financial system, you know, we can also call it the British Empire because if you understand empire not to be the British people, not even the island of Great Britain, but if you understand that the British Empire is that system of central banks and hedge funds and investment banks and insurance companies which determine the present financial architecture of the world, then you can actually see is that present system which has created this incredible world crisis. Now, we knew this was coming because my uh, late husband, Linda LaRouche, who was a very, very exceptional human being, and I can only encourage all of you who had not the fortune to meet him when he was alive, to watch one or many of his numerous videos which he has produced 
fortunately in webcasts in conference speeches and many other occasions because he represents a body of knowledge which is still the best resource we can go to to solve the present problems now he predicted in 1973 this was about the time or shortly after i joined his movement he predicted that the policies of the IMF and the World Bank on the effect on the developing countries would potentially lead to new pandemics. And we have been fighting for the last really half century uh, to not only analyze this danger, but to also you know, work out very concrete development programs, which would remedy this situation forever, for at least you know, maybe not prevent the outbreak of viruses and pandemics, but it would never recreate such a horrendous situation again like we are facing uh, today. So what is the situation? We have now a pandemic which uh, contrary to all the rumors of you know, the <clears throat> alternative media which says that this is just like a flu or just a plot by Bill Gates uh, to fill his pockets with vaccines or that it's made by China or you know, there are numerous such uh, wrong narratives. The reality is that this is a pandemic. It already is uh, ravaging the world economy uh, by forcing governments to go for lockdowns, which has not only you know, the number of deaths, people uh, dying from the pandemic of the COVID-19, but it is becoming a serious economic factor in addition to that. Now, this pandemic is about <clears throat> to go fully with a certain delay factor into the developing countries. Now, if, as if that would not be enough, because if you look that you know, many countries in Latin America and Africa and some Asian countries and even pockets of the United States and Europe don't have a health system which can deal with such a pandemic. So uh, as if that would not be enough, you have now uh, a breakdown of both the world economy and world agriculture. The world economy, uh, the ILO, the International Labour Organization, just published figures that 60% of the 3.3 billion jobs existing in the world labour force are so-called informal economy. That means that people you know, have no they don't pay taxes, they don't have social security, they don't have a health insurance, and they're living from the hand to the mouth. Now you can imagine if the governments are forced to make a lockdown in which they are doing in Africa, Indonesia, India, Brazil, and other uh, population rich countries, that this creates an immediate crisis. Uh, for example, in India, where <clears throat> the lockdown uh, exists since the end of March, 50% of all jobs are informal economy. So that means these people are now locked in their places, wherever they may be, and they don't have food. Uh, the, the government is trying to distribute food somehow, but it naturally uh, is a too big task to be solved. In Africa, you have a situation which is plagued by locust, by uh, HIV, tuberculosis, uh, and naturally malnutrition, which existed before all of this happens. So now we are confronted with the breakdown of the informal economy worldwide, and we are confronted on top of that with a complete crisis in agriculture because of the, con the impact of the coronavirus also lockdowns, but also interrupting the production chain uh, ca causing meat packing and meat uh, processing, food processing plants to be shut down because the employees are uh, infected. You have now uh, something which the head of the World Food Program, Dr. David Beasley, who just briefed the UN Security Council uh, at the end of April, uh, warning that we are confronted with a biblical crisis in terms of a famine looming worldwide. Now, I, I think this is uh, <coughs> really blowing everybody's mind if you don't, if you don't are uh, shocked already because the coincidence of all of these crises makes one thing very clear. 
You cannot solve this problem in one country. We are interlocked. Uh, we have a global food chain. The food which would be urgently to be delivered uh, to places like Africa is just running out of existence. It may not exist. So far, the World Food Program uh, used to uh, <coughs> send uh, food to Africa, for example, and, and Asia and Latin America 80, for 80 million people. Now, because of what I just said, the number of people who are in so-called food insecurity is around almost 900 million people already. And the people who are in dire need to get food or die of hunger uh, is probably jumping to about uh, 300 million <clears throat> uh, right now, for which the food is you know, in, in grave danger to even exist. Now, if this problem is not remedied, uh, the figures which are given out by the World Food Program is that as much as 300 people a day could die of hunger. Now, I mean, I think this is, you know, this is already more in one day than the entire coronavirus has caused in terms of casualties so far. So, you know, I have no idea where this could lead to if we don't change the system. Because you know the additional problem naturally is that we are in front of a, a gigantic blowout of the financial system, the casino economy, the central banks have started to just print money, quantitative easing, negative interest rates. All of this is coming together. And that is why we are saying that we need a complete change of the system in the short term. Now, if you look at the establishments, how do they react? They have not reported about the locust plague since a year where it was known. They are very slow in even reporting that there is a problem in the developing countries. Now they start saying, oh yeah, the poor developing countries, they don't have such a health system. Uh, and they have for sure not reflected about the fact that it was the policies of that very neoliberal establishment which did create the conditions in the third world for these problems to erupt in such, uh, with such a vengeance. So this is why you know, we are campaigning for a different approach. It will not come from the European Union because the EU is falling apart right now. And if you have questions about that, I'm happy to answer them. It will not come from the official institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, even the UN, you know, even so, there are some positive steps, like the non-aligned movement starts to take more responsibility. But we have determined for a very long time that the ideas of Mr. LaRouche are absolutely correct. That given the fact that the British Empire, in the form of this financial conglomerate, is so powerful that they have dominated the world system for the last 70 years or so, that you need a different combination of powers to change that. And that can only be the four most powerful nations of the world have to get together and simply declare a new system. And it has to be on the level of the presidents, of President Trump, of Xi Jinping, of Putin and Modi. And they have to have a summit. And then they have to declare <coughs> that they take responsibility for the entire human species, that this system is finished, it does not work, that you need a new system, and the new system would be relatively easy to be established if the political will would be there. What you need to do is to go back to the intention of Franklin D. Roosevelt uh, with the Bretton Woods system, except that you have to change it, uh, because when Truman and Churchill actually implemented uh, the Bretton Woods system after the death of Roosevelt, it did not take care of the developing countries in providing them a credit line. So these four presidents must be caused to declare a new system. They are powerful enough to do it. You have the two largest economy, the United States and China. You have the two largest nuclear powers, the United States and Russia, with a certain amount of nuclear capability on the side of China and India. Uh, and these four countries, if they work together, would be powerful enough to just declare 
a change of the system because systems are not God made, they are not <coughs> a part of the physical universe, but they are man made, and therefore, if they don't function, you can replace them. So, this is what we have to accomplish, and then we simply have to go into a completely new paradigm of international relations. There has to be a respect for sovereignty, for the different social system, non interference, end all military conflict, stop geopolitics, end the sanctions stop all military activities, transform the economies for the common good, and start with a building of a world health system, uh, start with a crash program for a food emergency a program, go into a crash program for food production, protect the family farms against the cartels, and then simply start to change the way how the entire economy is oriented by saying it has to be devoted only to the common good and the profit uh, of the many uh, is more important than the profit of the few. Now that can be done, uh, however it needs a mobilization. There are many forces in motion who are aware of the problem. I mentioned the uh, <coughs> World Food Program, uh, the World Health System, uh, the Non-Aligned Movement, and many other groups in the global south know that what I'm saying here is, is absolutely true, but you know they are not discussing yet the approach with the four summits, the new Bretton Woods system, and to go into a completely different system. And for that, we have to have this international youth movement. So we have produced a couple of things. Uh, we have a World uh, Health Program approach, it's called the Apollo Health Program, which outlines the immediate measures which must be taken to provide every country with a decent health system. Then we have uh, a food program, which uh, is uh, being published right now, which gives the first guidelines of what needs to be done to protect and save, expand food production worldwide. We have a petition uh, calling for this, and we have a new video which outlines except exactly that approach. So what I want you to do, I want you in every country where you are, first of all, get these four items around to as many young people as you can. Contact all the relevant institutions, the university departments, the ministries, the trade unions, the chambers of commerce, just every possible institution you can think of and get them to put pressure on your government that with the rising catastrophe becoming clear to everybody in terms of health and famine, that they have to demand that the four powers convene and conduct such a summit. I think that this idea can actually absolutely catch on. It can become a, a steamroller. And if we get, uh, let's say, 150 countries of the world, of Africa, of Latin America, and Asia, even European countries, and even forces inside the United States, demanding that we can create a chorus uh, where basically we can uh, force this approach of a solution, a global solution, uh, on the international agenda. So I think it needs young people, it needs people who are creative, it needs people who understand that this condition of humanity cannot continue like that. You could have said that many years ago, and that is why you know we joined this organization, why we responded to Mr. LaRouche, you know, because he was the only one who in the 70s, 80s, and 90s and so forth presented these solutions. He was, you know, he was proposing these solutions you know, as early as the 70s. But now is the difference that after he is that dead for a little bit more than one year, all of what he predicted would happen is now upon us. And we must not miss this opportunity that he predicted these developments, he developed the solutions, but now he is no longer with us and it is his heritage what we have to fulfill, because if you look around, there are no other organizations which have that approach. So what we have to do is we have to expand this youth movement very, very rapidly. It has to become 
a mass movement of people who demand a just system where every human being on this planet has the right to have a full life, not shortened by IMF conditionalities, a full life, full creativity, live the full creative potential which every human being on this planet has as an inalienable right. And that is what I would call human dignity. Uh, so it is upon us to do all of that. I think it can be done. I think it will be a stormy way ahead, but I'm absolutely sure that we are in one of the absolutely unique moments where you can change an entire system and bring the world into order. And that's what we should discuss.